This beautiful couture ball gown by the House of Worth was recently donated to the Olive Matthews collection by the estate of the costume collector Sheila Lovett Turner. It dates to winter 1897 and is typical of the opulent and glamorous formal evening wear worn by wealthy women during the 1890s. The gown belonged to Baroness Philadelphia Robertson, who later wore it, with red velvet robes and this coronet, to the coronation of Edward VII in 1902. The House of Worth was established by Charles Frederick Worth, who is sometimes known as the father of haute couture. It was one of the earliest and most famous couture houses of the 19th century, and it continued well into the 20th century. Charles Frederick was an Englishman who, after starting his career in the textile and fashion trade in London, decided to move to Paris in 1845. There he worked for the Mercers and Drapers Gagelin, finding some success in dress design before branching out to establish the fashion house Worth et Beaubert with Otto Beaubert in 1858. The house gained a number of aristocratic and royal clients, including the Empress Eugenie, wife of Napoleon III, the second emperor of France. Worth became Eugenie's personal dressmaker and a raft of influential and wealthy clients followed. The result was a rapid expansion of the firm. When he started his business in 1858, Worth had 20 seamstresses. By 1870, when he became the sole proprietor, he had 1,200. This early 1870s Worth afternoon dress, from the collections of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, shows a clever and subtle contrast between chevron pattern silk satin and silk faille. We see elements of luxury and subtle fabric contrasts, for which the house was already famous. Worth's business became a sizeable operation, and one that worked a little like a factory production line, with different departments for different parts of the garments, such as sleeves, skirts and so on. Despite this semi-industrial approach, the House of Worth managed to maintain an air of exclusivity. This was achieved through careful quality control and the use of the finest fabrics available. Though Worth designed a set of specific models each season, Clever individual innovations were devised for each client. The supreme ability to combine texture, pattern and perfect fit were further hallmarks of the house, and of course the pieces were reassuringly expensive. Charles Frederick Worth trained both his sons to take over his business. Jean-Philippe started to work in his father's atelier from around 1875, and by the 1890s he had more or less taken control of the design output of the house. His brother Gaston worked on the financial side. Charles Frederick died in 1895 and Jean-Philippe Worth presided over the most prolific period of the house's history, the 1890s and early 1900s, the era from which our gown dates. Many of the Worth gowns now held in public collections across the world date from this later period, though by the 1890s other fashion houses such as Doucet, Paquin, Calosseur and Pingat were competing with Worth for wealthy clients. The influential designs of these and other leading fashion houses emanated from Paris, and between them they established the main fashionable looks of the era. It is no coincidence that many of the fashion plates of the time show gowns that are very similar in cut and overall style to our Worth gown. When this gown came to the collection, it was in need of considerable conservation treatment. The silk lining of the bodice was splitting along some of the boning and under the armholes, this damage had been caused by wear and by sweat. Externally, the delicate silk mousseline and lace was also split and damaged. The skirt was in very poor condition. There were many problems with the waistband and severe splitting of the central panel at the front. There was a further, more significant problem with the skirt. The back panels, which would have made the train, were missing. We have speculated as to whether these might have been removed in order to make a garment during wartime when fabric was scarce. The loss of these panels made the waist seem much smaller than it should have been, especially when compared to the bodice, and created an odd point at the back. It presented a problem in terms of how we would make the gown displayable. In order to work out how the dress might once have looked, we undertook research in the archives of the v &A, which holds photograph albums rescued from the House of Worth when it closed in 1956. It was also possible to search the online archives of the Metropolitan Museum, New York, which has a number of Worth gowns. Though less elaborate, this silk ball gown from the Met is of a similar date and style to our gown. The shape of the train and others from Southside House in London helped to inform decisions about the missing piece. 
Eventually, we opted for a very simple, detachable silk section that filled the gap and was right, the right proportion and tone for display purposes, but did not deceive visitors into thinking that the replacement section was original. The conservation meant that the gown was once more a displayable piece, though it remains extremely fragile and must be handled and stored with the greatest care. The overall impression of the gown, when seen mounted and conserved in all its glory, is one of sumptuous femininity. This is achieved through the use of the highest quality materials, the creation of an exaggerated hourglass shape and the judicious use of soft lace and mousseline trimmings. The silhouette is of the prevailing fashionable style of the time, as can be seen from this 1897 fashion plate, which shows similar winged shoulder trimmings and the use of lighter coloured silk at the centre of both bodice and skirt, an approach which draws upon historical styles for its inspiration. The main structure of the bodice is designed to give the impression that it is a wraparound style, with one pleated panel of green silk damask crossing over another in an asymmetrical form. Note how the woven pattern of the lilies has been carefully incorporated and the petals cut out at the edge on the left. At the centre front of the bodice, a white silk panel is added to give a layered look, almost as if there is an under bodice. This has been embroidered with silver metalwork embroidery, now tarnished but originally a bright shiny silver. The embroidery gives a focal point to the bodice and it has also been added to the edges of the green silk sections, which helps the two areas flow together. The embroidery may have been done in-house or by the House of Lesage, who carried out embroidery commissions for Worth at this time. Further trimmings in the form of machine lace and silk mousseline are also seen at the front of the bodice. These soften the style at the centre front and give width and height to the shoulders. The zigzag lace edging has been embellished with silver sequins, which again would have glittered in the light. The back of the bodice is more symmetrical in style. We see the green satin framing and slightly overlapping a triangular section of metal embroidered white satin at the centre. This is once more trimmed with zigzag lace. Two tails of satin trimmed with lace descend below the waistline. This image of the outside of the bodice laid flat gives a good idea of its construction. Inside the bodice we can see that it is lined with green silk and bone, probably with whalebone. It is fastened at the back first with a waist stay, with a hook and eye, and then laced using silk ribbon threaded through the many small eyelets. Once laced together, the triangular white silk satin section is secured with small hooks and eyes that are hidden from view. Such a rear fastening method meant that it was impossible to put this gown on alone. The help of a lady's maid was essential. Also visible on the waist stay is the Worth label. Interestingly, you can make out a blue date stamp on the right. It is difficult to read in the photo, but it says Paris, hiver or winter, 1897. This small addition makes this gown very special, as 1897 was the only year during the 19th century when the House of Worth rubber-stamped and dated their garments. It was a short-lived strategy to prevent illegal copies of Worth gowns being produced. Elizabeth Ann Coleman has written about this in her book, The Opulent Era, Fashions of Worth, Doucet and Pingat. She worked out that it was possible to date other undated garments using the bolduck or house order number found on the back of the labels of the dated garments. She did this by comparing these numbers, which run consecutively, to those of the surviving undated examples. It is also possible to understand how many evening dresses Worth was making in a particular year. In 1897 they made 500. Sadly, only a small proportion of these are known to have survived. The majority of the skirt is constructed from pale green silk satin to match the bodice. This is damask woven with large, attractive sprays of lilies in gold and white. The back of the skirt would once have had a longer trained section, now missing as discussed earlier, which may also have featured the lily pattern. The House of Worth was known for its use of beautiful fabrics with large, tastefully wrought designs. These were frequently inspired by nature, with flowers, feathers and butterflies all seen on surviving pieces. Turning to the front of the skirt, you can see that the green satin is cut to reveal a separate white satin section as it curves away at the sides. This mimics 18th century style dress. Gowns of the 1700s 
incorporated both the bodice and skirt as one, and the skirt was usually open at the front to show a separate petticoat beneath. In this 1890s ball gown, the bodice is a separate item, and the skirt is constructed as one piece without a visible unconnected petticoat, but nevertheless appearing to have one. The white silk satin panel at the front gives the impression of the 18th century Georgian style that adheres to more modern Victorian principles of construction. This lighter coloured area also ties in with the use of white silk in the bodice. Over the plain white silk satin, a soft layer of silk mousseline has been added. This features a row of frills halfway down, stitched in a V-shape to echo the dip at the base of the bodice. Towards the hem of the skirt, beneath a further row of frills, a generous flounce of cream lace has been added. The zigzag edging matches that used on the bodice. The skirt would once have had a placket opening at the centre back with small hook and eye fastenings. Due to the loss of the central back panel, all that remains is a single hook and eye fastening, which may or may not be original. As with all formal gowns of the 19th century, we should not forget that this piece was originally worn with many accessories and underpinnings. Long white evening gloves were essential. They stretched well above the elbow and were usually of fine kid leather like this pair. Jewellery was also necessary and lace bands were common accessories for evening. The outfit would have been finished with a pair of heeled evening shoes similar to these but probably with the silk dyed green to match the gown. Beneath the outer layer, knitted silk stockings, a pair of combinations or linen chemise and drawers and highly restrictive bone stays were worn. The skirt was supported by layers of stiffened petticoats which helped to create the correct silhouette. Dressed in her Worth gown and all its accompanying finery, Baroness Robertson could grace the most formal of occasions with confidence and style.